Well, I think, you know, the liberal international order is one of these uh, cant phrases that almost everybody is in favour of, except maybe a few uh, wild-eyed populists. But when you look at the history a little bit more sceptically, it's not as if in 1945 uh, Harry Truman said, we're going to have a liberal international order, everybody, uh, followed by multiple decades of prosperity, only to be destroyed by wicked Donald Trump. That is not what happened. What happened after World War II was, in fact, a, an extraordinarily even contest between uh, a capitalist model and the communist model. The world was deeply divided, and about half of it certainly didn't have the liberal international order. There was lo nothing liberal about it. Uh, and it was international only in the sense of Jeremy Corbyn's favorite uh, song. As for order, well, the Cold War was characterized by very high levels of disorder, particularly in the, in the third world. It's, I think, only really worth talking about a liberal international order in the period after 1989. In the 1990s and 2000s, the integration of, of China in particular, but other communist economies into the world economy uh, transformed everything. Supply of labor, return to capital, and that was a global uh, economic revolution we saw. And it was a, a liberal international order imposed not least by the World Trade Organization, as well as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. China joined the WTO, and I think one can date its uh, almost exponential uh, growth, certainly its catch up with the United States from that moment. That's really what is at issue. The question is, number one, did it make sense for the United States and other Western powers to allow China this extraordinary path uh, to power and prosperity? We essentially helped China. We invested in China, we allowed China uh, the uh, most uh, favorable trade uh, relations with us. Uh, we allowed uh, China to export in vast amounts cheap manufacturers to our economies. And as a result, China's economy went from being uh, maybe 2 or 3% of global GDP to being the largest economy in the world, according to the IMF. Uh, the second question, uh, which seems to me in some ways the, the, the key question here is, uh, is there an alternative, and is it already manifesting itself, a less global world economy in which there's less free trade, less capital move, moving across borders, and less migration? And I think the answer to that question is almost certainly the peak of globalization is in the rearview mirror, partly for political reasons and partly for technological reasons. We don't need as much globalization. There will be less, I think, migration. There will be less free trade. There will be less cross-border capital movements over the next 20 years compared with the last 20 years. And I think that will be a good thing because I think we overshot. I think globalization went too far. I think the elites at Davos took it too far and then were surprised, no, shocked when ordinary people said, screw this, because the median American household saw no real income growth from 1999 to the present. It was a flat line. Actually, it was a round trip. They went down and then they crawled their way back up. The benefits of globalization went overwhelmingly to the top 1% of income earners, to the people who go to Davos. Ordinary people did not benefit that much in the West from globalization. Ordinary Chinese people benefited a whole lot from it. But these were very asymmetrical outcomes, and it shouldn't surprise us that there was a backlash against the model in 2016.